Hello everybody, Jason here. Sorry, this has taken so damn long. Literally every time I record this, audio cuts out at some point, so hopefully this will be the one. If not, you'll never know. I sure as hell will. Alright, welcome to After Effects. Alright, so when you open the program, uh, this is what you will see. Okay, typically if you don't see this, it doesn't mean it's broken, but this is typically what pops up when uh, you do open After Effects. All right? So you can go through a tutorial if you feel that I'm not doing a good enough job, which hopefully is not the case. Uh, we can also then choose new project. We can choose to open a project. Uh, we could choose to create a composition from footage. So if we already had a pre-rendered file and we wanted to work on that, we could use that. But we're just going to go new project, and this is where we are. All right, so let me run you through these work areas quickly. First off, if you're not looking at this exact layout, what I'd like you to do is just scroll on over to Window, click on that, hover over Workspace, and bring yourself down to Reset Default. All right, so you'll see we've got a couple of options here. Default is checked, and Resetting Default will just turn it back uh, to the way it was, and we should all be looking at the same screen. So if you ever jump onto a machine and someone's messed around with it, or you can't find what you're looking for, or you hit a button and your workspace just looks completely different, remember Window, Workspace, Reset Default. All right. So let's take you through a couple of our options. Right. So we've got our project panel over here. This is something that I'll explain in greater detail as we go forward throughout the year. But it's just good to know that this is where whatever we bring inside of After Effects, whether it be images, video files, uh, pre-rendered footage, 3D assets, they will all be displayed here. And we can drag and drop them into our animation as we go. All right. We then have our composition space. OK, this is our workspace. If we click on New Composition, boom, we open up this window. OK, I'll walk you through this in a moment. Finish going through these over here. These are our tabs. Currently, Library is open. This thing is pretty cool. It links to your personal uh, Adobe account. And anything that you save off of Adobe Cooler or any graphics that you decide to save onto the cloud can be accessed here. So you don't have to worry about not having files. So you can see I've got a couple of things that I downloaded in the past, some stock images um, that we used. And yeah, so the library is fairly basic. Click on that to close it. We've got info, not really something that we use, but it just gives you your RGBA spectrum. And when you're in a composition, it will give you your X and Y position of your cursor. Audio, when we work with audio files towards the end of this term, we can do a little bit of editing over here. Um, not as prominent as in Premiere Pro or Adobe Audition, but still perfectly viable as an audio editing software at our level. Okay, then we've got preview. Now, preview is what we will be going through again when I jump into the composition, so we'll get back to that. Effects and presets. This is the absolute, uh, the, the complete library, rather, of all the effects and plugins inside of After Effects. Each one of these has its own little drop down arrow, and uh, I could then pick any one of these, drop it onto my assets, and then mess around with the uh, controls for that. There are hundreds of them. There are millions of different options and things that you can do with them. Uh, literally not enough time in an entire year to go through and learn every single one of these. So we will simply be exploring some of the more important ones. And then um, as we progress throughout the years, we'll start experimenting with some of the others. All right. Align works the same way as it does in Photoshop and Illustrator. You can just align your assets to either your selection or your workspace. Uh, libraries, I've already said. Character, exactly the same as in Photoshop and Microsoft Word. We choose our typeface, um, our, choose our font, etc. Um, we've got paragraph, which allows us to then dictate whether or not it's center aligned, left aligned, justified, etc. And then we have tracker, which is really cool because um, this allows us to do motion tracking with live footage, which is something we'll jump into in our second year. Okay. Uh, then we've got our timeline as well. This will make more sense when we have a composition. So let's jump into that quickly. So we select new composition. Again, we could say from footage, but we don't have any footage. Ergo comp settings. Uh, you'll see that the first thing we can do is we can rename this. We're going to call this class example. All right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then we're going to take a look at our presets. Yours might not look like this. Uh, so we're just going to hit this little drop down. And we're going to scroll all the way down to HDTV 1080-25. All right, so that means that we are animating at full HD, 1920 by 1080 pixels. 
uh, and we will be animating at 25 frames a second, industry standard. All right, pixel aspect ratio, let's make sure it's set to square pixels. If it isn't, things look really weird until you actually render the video, so um, rather just have that looking right from the very beginning. Then we've got our resolution, which we can have at full. All right, uh, start time code. This, all these zeros just mean that we're going to start at the very beginning of our timeline over here. And then the duration. Uh, this is how long this particular timeline is going to be. So the first zero over here, that is hours. Then we have minutes, seconds. Let's set that to zero, 05. And then we have individual frames. All right, so we're going to set that to five seconds long. Then our background color. So if I click on this, we get a little color picker. This is not really important because uh, it, it can actually be quite confusing to some because you're basically only picking the color of your workspace, right? So black, white, if you prefer to animate on red, like a psycho, it's completely up to you. But whatever this color is, it will not be rendered in your video, all right? We have to make a separate layer for a background. So don't confuse yourselves and think that you want to have your animation take place over a red background and then um, get caught out when it renders out black. All right, so basically I would say either choose to animate on white or black. I prefer black, so we'll keep it at that and we'll say OK. And as soon as I say OK, you'll see that my composition panel changes, right? So I've got my actual workspace over here. I've got my zoom option currently 50%. I can say fit or fit up to 200% and it'll take up my whole screen. Um, if I click on this little drop down here, I've got my options, so I can choose to turn on my title and action safe, which we'll explore later in the year. This basically just tells me where footage would be cut off on certain devices. Uh, I can turn on my proportion grid. Uh, I can turn on just like an actual grid, uh, which I can turn off again, and I can turn proportion grid off as well. We won't be needing those. Okay. Uh, we've got this option here, toggle masks and shape path visibility. Just means that when we create assets, they will have a sort of border or an outline. We've got where we are in the actual timeline. Okay. Uh, we've got snapshot, which allows us to take a picture of this frame and then compare it to another. For example, if you're doing color correction, uh, we've got our resolution. We set that to full already, but we can change that while we're working. All right. Uh, region of interest, you can sort of set, not something that we use too often. Toggle transparency, very important. If I turn that on, you'll see that my space changes completely. This just means that there is no background. All right, if I had a layer there and I turned this on, we wouldn't see it. All right, so we can just turn that back off again. Active camera, don't worry about this. This only really matters when we're working with simulated 3D space. Single view, uh, currently one view, we see it as is. Two views, we get some different screens like this. So if you ever end up with a workspace that looks kind of strange like this, just make sure that your number of views is set to one. All right, then we've got the pixel aspect ratio correction, which is only really necessary when we bring in pre-rendered footage. Uh, fast preview just allows our machines to um, render at a faster pace without caching too much information. Not very important at this phase. Um, our timeline, we already have. Then we've got our composition flowchart, which is something that we'll explore later in the term. And then we can reset our exposure. So basically, this is if we um, change the exposure in this particular view, we can reset that. Right, So I can slide up and down with that. Okay, so that's basically the rundown for our composition. Then we've got our timeline. All right, now you'll notice that we've got two distinct parts to the timeline. This area is where our layers will be found. And then this area is where uh, we will actually be doing the animation. We'll be telling the machine to start recording information at X point in time and then changing that information um, over the course of X amount of frames or seconds. All right, so let's jump into it. We've got a couple of tools at the top that are very similar to the ones in Photoshop and Illustrator. Right, we've got our selection tool, shortcut for that is V, and I can use this to click around and drag things, select my objects. Uh, I've got my hand tool, shortcut is H, and I can move my workspace around, very important to be able to do that. Uh, my zoom tool, shortcut is Z, so I can click to zoom in, I can option, alt, or um, yeah, Alt click to zoom out. I think that would be the case for the Windows users. Um, and then, very cool tool. I don't want to always have to go back and hit H because uh, I sort of want to move around. What if I'm working with an uh, object over here and then I want to move over there, but I'm zoomed in, right? So we're animators, we're very lazy. So what I'd like to do then is if I just hold down spacebar, you'll see that the hand tool automatically becomes selected. 
and as soon as I let go of the spacebar, the tool that I had selected comes back again. All right, so it's the same in Photoshop, same in Illustrator. Hold down spacebar, you activate the hand tool, and you can move around your workspace. Okay, so I'll just click that back to fit. You can also zoom in and zoom out by scrolling. All right, so you don't necessarily need to use the zoom tool. Uh, the rotation tool will make more sense when we have a shape on the screen. We'll get to that. Unified camera tool, this is what we use when we simulate 3D space inside of After Effects. We'll be doing that in our fourth term. It's a lot of fun. I'm actually really excited to get there with you guys. Then we have the most important tool inside of After Effects, the pan behind tool. All right, but in order to explore why that is important, we need a shape on screen first. So let's jump to that. We've got a rectangle tool. If I click and hold, I can access my rounded rectangle, ellipse, polygon, and star tool. We'll keep it on rectangle for now. And you'll see as soon as I select the tool, either that shape tool or the pen tool, which is right next to it, you'll see that some options appear over here. Fill and stroke. All right. So fill is the color picking um, tool, and stroke determines whether or not our shape has an outline. So let's just quickly hold down shift, click and drag, and we'll get ourselves a perfect square. All right. So to do that, you click and drag, but you hold down shift at the same time. All right. So let's just make sure we only have one shape. And you'll see it obviously has the same color as our fill option over here. So if I click on that, uh, I can then change its color. You'll see that my color picker live updates that particular shade or whatever it is, the, the hue, tone, etc. that I'm selecting. Uh, let's have a nice gaudy red and we'll say okay to that. Now I don't have a stroke. You'll see that we've got a red line through this over here. So if I select this and then select white, for example, it turns my stroke on for me say OK. And I get some options uh, for the pixel width over here. Currently it's set on 20. So if I click and drag to the left, it gets smaller. Drag to the right, it gets bigger. And if I know exactly how big I want it to be, I can always click on it and type in exactly the size that I want. OK. But let's say we don't want to fill or we don't want to stroke. To get rid of them, we simply have to click on the actual words. Rule of thumb in After Effects, if it's blue, it's a button. All right. So stroke. I click on that and I get my stroke options. I can have a sort of linear gradient, a radial gradient, or I can turn it off completely. I can also change my blend modes. All right, so we'll turn that off. And I could do the same for fill, right? I could have a linear gradient, radial gradient, solid color, or off. All right, so we'll just keep that on red for now. Okay, so now I've made my shape. What I want to do is just grab my selection tool so I can actually move it around. And there we go. I can now move this wherever I go. Click off of it, click back on it. Now, notice this little icon over here. All right, This is the anchor point. This point is around which everything we do in terms of our transformation will take place. That sentence didn't really make sense, I apologize. Um, but yeah, this is very important. Okay, So if I want my square to rotate around the center, I need this point to be in the center of my square. Okay. But if I click and drag with my selection tool, it moves the entire shape, which obviously doesn't help. So in order to fix that, I need the pan behind tool, this option over here. Shortcut is Y. We select that, and you'll see that I can't move my square at all, but I can move my anchor point, which is why that pan behind tool is one of the most important tools in After Effects at this level. Okay. So I want to try and get into the center, and I want to make sure that it is in the center. So I'm going to hold down either Control or Command if you're on a Mac. And when you do that, while clicking and dragging, it will snap either to the center or whichever one of the points we are putting it on. OK, so we'll just snap it there. And then I can click away from my shape, hit V to get my selection tool, and now our anchor point is in the center. OK, one thing that I would like to point out that does sometimes confuse a lot of people um, I'm just going to draw another square. Cool, I've drawn this square. There is its anchor point over there. V for the selection tool. And as soon as I hit V, my anchor point that was sitting over here has disappeared. And we get this tiny little anchor point look-alike here in the center. Now this is a sneaky bugger. It is a false anchor point. It basically just shows you where the center of the shape is. But it doesn't do anything else besides that. You can't animate around it. If I try and rotate this with my rotation tool, Nice segue over there. Um, <clears throat> rather using rotation here, you'll see that it rotates around the anchor point that we couldn't see. Okay, Control Z to undo. So when you make a new shape and you click away from it, always, or when you make a new shape, rather, 
have it selected and then click away and click back onto it. Make sure that you're working with the big anchor point. All right, um, very important. Otherwise, we might end up doing a lot of animation work uh, that didn't really require the anchor point to begin with. And then as soon as we do such as like scaling or rotation, it just freaks everything out. Okay, so just a little pointer and I'll be there to remind you throughout the year. So we can de delete that one. All right, so we've got our little square. And you'll see now that as we have this shape, we also have some layer information inside of our timeline. Okay, so it's called shape layer one. Uh, not exactly the most eloquent name, so I will rename that. Um, but it's not like Photoshop in the sense that I can't double click on the layer to rename it. I have to select the layer and hit enter or return. Then I can label it uh, red square and enter again and it has been successfully renamed. All right, one of the big differences with After Effects from Photoshop. Um, then we've got this little star. This means that it is a shape layer. It's something that we've made inside of After Effects. Uh, depending on what kind of footage it is, the symbol might change. Uh, it's number one. It is currently layer one. If we had multiple layers, it would go one, two, three, four, five, etc. We've got a little blue square, which dictates the color in our timeline. So if I click on that, I get all of these different options. I'm quite a fan of uh, cyan and fuchsia. All right, lovely pink. Um, so this just helps you label things when you're working with multiple layers. So personally, whenever I'm working with text layers, I make them all yellow uh, so that I can sort of just find them quickly on the, on the timeline. So whatever works for you guys, um, you'll come up with your own sort of crazy language that will make sense only to you. Um, okay, so we can change our color there. We've got a little lock icon. All right, this just means that uh, we then obviously can't select the shape at all. We can't work with it. So once we're done with something, we can lock it, be done with it. Solo icon, to show that, I'm going to need another shape. So let me just make that one over there. Uh, and let's just change its color so that we don't get confused. All right. So, and these little drop downs, sorry, these allow me to collapse these layers. So solo is the opposite of turning the little eye off. Right, so you'll see if I turn the eye off for the layer, it becomes invisible, right? It's the same as in Photoshop. But if I solo something, it's the opposite. I'm basically saying only show this layer, turn everything else off. I can solo multiple layers, right? Which comes in handy when you're working with like a single character in a field full of objects. Um, but just know that that is an option as well. Not something that we'll need anytime soon, but it is there should we need it. And then we can delete that one and carry on. All right, so we have this little drop down you'll see that we've got a couple of options here under our square, okay? The first one is contents, and under contents is the actual rectangle. Uh, the reason why we have this and why it's called rectangle one is because it is possible to have more than one shape on a single layer, all right? It can get a little bit confusing. It's not something that I personally enjoy working with because it just, like, I just never get to wrap my head around it, but it's an option. Uh, under that, there is the path, which has all of its own options, the stroke, which has even more options, the full, and then transformation options. Okay, but it's important to realize we never use anything under contents. Okay, we don't use the transform rectangle one to do anything. We're just going to collapse contents and we're going to work with the actual transform option. Okay, so let's always make sure that we're working on transform. It doesn't have a colon and then another name. Okay, so we don't use these we use these. Okay, I think we're clear by now. Cool. So these are basically um, the building blocks for our animation. Okay, we've got our opacity, which if I drag down to zero, obviously makes our object more or more or less visible. We have rotation, uh, the degrees by which allows me to do exact degrees. I can also click and type in exactly 45. I get 45 degrees, etc. Um, the number next to that is full 360 degree rotation. So if I drag that along, nothing's going to happen at the moment. But if I were to um, create a rotation keyframe and then tell it to rotate uh, two times over two seconds, it would simply do that. All right, so don't get confused if you drag this and nothing happens. Okay, so let's just reset that to zero. Then we have scale, right? Easy to figure out what that does. Um, you'll see this little chain link icon, right? It means constrained proportions. So if I change the height or the width, it will change the other value. Okay, if I want to work with only one of the values, I can click on that little link icon, you'll see it disappears. And now I can work with the height and the width value separately. All right, 
control or command Z to undo that, take it back to 100%. Position changes where the object is on the screen. All right, we don't necessarily animate using these values, uh, sort of sliding these values. It's a lot more intuitive to obviously move it around yourself, but it's obviously an important piece of information that we need to record when we animate. All right, then we have the anchor point. Now, this might sound confusing, but we don't animate with the anchor point, especially not at this level. Um, you might think that if I were to change the position of the anchor point, the anchor point would move around the screen, right? But that's not the case. It simply pushes the object around the anchor point. Okay, so it doesn't work the way one might think it does, um, and it just makes animating the position quite confusing. So there are definitely times when we could animate with it, but uh, today is not that day. All right, and with these values comes a very interesting and important uh, shortcut acronym. All right, so I'm going to just quickly collapse, bring that back out, and grab my text tool quickly so I can hit you up with some knowledge. All right, so I'd like you to remember T-R-A-P-S. All right, traps. If I have my layer selected, and I want to work with only the opacity. I can hit T, think of it as transparency, and it will bring up the opacity. If I want rotation, I can hit R. If I want the anchor point, which we don't, but if you ever do, it's A, P for position, and S for scale. All right, if I want both rotation and scale, I've already selected S for scale, and I hold down Shift and hit R for rotation, it will add that to the list, add um, position, add transparency. And then as I'm done with those, I can just hit those buttons again while holding shift and they will go away again. Okay. So really cool shortcuts to have. It just helps you save screen space, right? This is a lot of unnecessary information if you're only working with rotation. Okay. Um, this timeline is, is gold, right? Real estate is gold here. And when you're working with hundreds of layers, um, being able to bring up just the one value that you want to work with is a very neat trick to know. Okay, so I'm just going to collapse that, and there we go, and I'll get rid of that for us. Okay, so now we've got a shape. We actually want to make it move, right? So I'm going to hit my selection tool, and I'm going to select my square, and I'm going to hit P for position. Okay, um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this little stopwatch. Now, anything that has a stopwatch, if I open all this up again, anything that has a stopwatch can be animated. All right, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of things that can be animated in After Effects. Position obviously being one of them. As soon as I click on the stopwatch, you will see, let me hit P again just to solo that, that it turns blue and we get this little blue icon over here. All right, we've also got a little blue diamond on our actual timeline. This is what we call a keyframe. This is a piece of recorded information. Okay, so at the beginning of an animation, we always need a point for the beginning. Um, nothing's going to happen if I drag my timeline down by clicking on my little time indicator here. We haven't told it to change at all, but we have told it to pay attention to this current piece of information at this point in time, because we're going to make it do something. All right, so I'm going to drag my timeline out to the two second mark, and then I'm going to select my shape and I'm just going to drag it across the screen to the right hand side. Holding down shift will snap it to a perfect line and release. You'll see as soon as I release it creates another keyframe for us. All right. So we always have to hit the stopwatch to make a keyframe to begin with. We need to tell the computer cool pay attention to what's happening here because it's going to change and I want the change to occur. All right. We then drag ourselves out to the point where we want the change to finish happening and we can either then move our shape around, right? That will create a keyframe. Um, or we could have dragged our values back and forth, etc. But any change that we make after having made a keyframe will be recorded. Okay. Nothing that I do to scale or rotation will be recorded because we haven't set the initial keyframe, right? I know that this is sounding repetitive, but some people struggle to grasp the idea that we have to begin with a keyframe in order for an animation to then change by the second keyframe. All right, so now I've got this uh, amazing animation. If I hit spacebar, it will play back for me, and it will play back over the course of those two seconds. All right, so now's the time to quickly take a look at this option over here, the preview option, okay, because now it will make sense. My shortcut for my preview is set to spacebar, so if I hit spacebar, it will play back the timeline. 
All right? I've got an option underneath that. I can turn off the site. All right? So if I do that, then interesting. Maybe it only works with oh, play video and preview. Okay. So if we've got rendered video in the background, it'll play it or not, or audio in the background or not. Okay. Um, our range. We've got the entire work area. All right, we'll be dabbling with that in a moment. Play from currently set to current time. All right, so that means that if I am at the two second mark and I hit spacebar, it will play from the two second mark. But if I'm at the two second mark and this is set to start of range, wherever I am on my timeline and I hit spacebar, it will play from the very beginning. So whatever uh, floats your goat, you can decide what you want for that. Frame rate 25. We're obviously not going to change that because that's what we're actually animating at. Um, skip, if we're working on a particularly heavy project, we can tell it to skip a certain number of frames and then um, it'll just make it easier for our computer to cache that. Resolution, we can tell it to play back at a, at a quarter resolution. Um, not something that you're really going to see on this. Uh, maybe if we really zoomed in, I don't know, it's a perfect square, so we're not going to get much pixelation. But if we had assets brought in from Illustrator or Photoshop, for example, that would pixelate quite horribly. Um, we can click full screen so that when I RAM preview it back, it makes my animation full screen. I don't like that jump that you see, so I never have that on. Um, okay, so that's what we need to know about preview. Um, you'll also see that, um, sort of just taking a look at this work area range. Let's take a look at this quickly. So if I start from the beginning and I hit spacebar, play back my magnificent animation, and then we have to sit and wait for these like three dead seconds to go by before it loops back around again. Okay, that's wasted time. We don't need to sit and wait for that. So <clears throat> right below my little current time indicator, I've got this gray bar. And this is called the time ruler. And you'll see at the edge of the time ruler, on the right side and the left side, are little blue heads. And as we said, if it's blue, we can touch it. So if I click and drag that, I'll drag it down to the two second mark, I have now changed the length of my workspace. If I hit spacebar while I'm inside that timeline, it will only play back what's inside that gray bar. All right, if I'm outside the timeline and I hit spacebar, it'll play the whole thing, and then it'll loop back inside and carry on playing the whole thing. All right, but if we're inside this, it will only play back what we've set. Okay, so now I don't have to sit and wait for those three seconds to disappear, but if I wanted to start animating on individual frames, um, I would have to zoom in a lot further on this uh, because of this dead space. I can do that by clicking on this little mountain over here, or zooming out with that, <coughs> or just sliding this back and forth. Okay, so we zoom all the way in, we see individual frames, zoom all the way out, we see individual seconds. Okay, but like I said earlier, real estate is gold when it comes to After Effects. So all this wasted space, we don't need it, we don't want it. So <coughs> what we are going to do, before I get rid of it, is just quickly walk you through this range, um, because I am a forgetful bastard. So. Currently, it's set to work area extended by current timeline. What that means is, if my timeline, if my indicator is inside of my workspace, it will play that back. But it will play beyond that point if my timeline uh, indicator is sitting beyond that point. Okay? If I set that to only be in the work area and I hit spacebar, it's only going to play within that space. And even if I'm outside the workspace, it will only play inside that space. All right? Um, and if we set it to the entire duration, it doesn't matter what I've done with this point, it's going to play the entire timeline. All right, so pretty much saying that it's uh, just a good idea to just use the work area extended by timeline. It gives you best of both worlds. Okay, but now we've decided that this is dead space. We don't need this anymore. So if I right click on my work area, this gray bar over here, right click, we get a couple of options. We want to select the third option trim comp to work area, right? So I, I right click on this little gray bar, trim comp to work area, and it gets rid of all that dead space, right? It's not technically gone. If I had any keyframes in that space, it would still animate, but now at least I'm only seeing the information that is relevant to me at this point in time. All right, makes sense, hopefully, if we're all like on the right page at this point, and that you're not all frustrated and confused and regretting life decisions. Um, okay. So now we have got our square moving from left to right, and it is really boring. Let's be honest, there's really nothing entertaining about the square moving from left to right. Um, if you do find this entertaining, 
you've set the bar quite low for yourself and you're absolutely going to love all the films that we show you while we study. Okay, so the first thing that I'd like to do is introduce a little bit of interest to my actual path because something moving in a straight line while natural is not necessarily exciting. Okay, so if we select our shape and we take a look at our little path over here, this is the path indicating along which the, the shape would move, we see all these little dots. These little dots represent where that shape would be at any particular frame. So every time I move on to a new frame, it moves on to a new little ball. Okay, but cool thing, if I select either one of the keyframes or one of these little boxes at the end of the line, you'll see that I get access to a slightly larger ball over here. Right? It's a little bit difficult to see, but it is distinguishable from the smaller balls. That is a handle. Right? So if I just drag this out to the middle quickly at the one second mark, I've got one on the left hand side as well. And if I click on the big dot and drag, I can introduce a curve to my path. All right. So now if I play it back, my square follows that particular point, which is now making it a little bit more uh, interesting than it already was. Okay, But it's moving at the same speed, and it's super boring. Okay, So now we've added the curve, but it's not looking too great. Um, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to add what we call interpolation. Okay, It's just a fancy word for telling it that over the course of these two seconds, I want it to move uh, faster in the middle, slower at the beginning, slower at the end. Right, so if we think about an object, uh, it needs to overcome inertia in order to start moving. So it has to speed up, and then it needs to start braking before it gets to the very end. So it has to slow down. Okay. So in order to do that, I am going to click inside of my timeline here, and I am just going to click and drag over my little um, keyframe, or I can simply click on top of it. And then I'm going to hold down Shift, and I'm going to select my other keyframe. And you'll see that they are selected when they are both blue. All right. Now, if I right-click on top of the keyframe, not to the right of it or to the left of it, on top of the keyframe, I get a couple of options here. And I want to hover over the very last one and then select the very first one, Easy Ease. As soon as I do that, my icons change from diamonds into little hourglasses. All right. And you'll see that our dots are quite spaced out in the center and then they get closer together towards the end. And what that means is our shape is going to start off slower, speed up towards the middle, and then slow down towards the end. Okay, now we can change that even further using a magical tool known as the graph editor, which we'll jump into next week, uh, or in week four rather. It's that little button over there. But if I have my line selected, I can tell it to behave completely differently. All right, so I could tell it to snap. I could tell it to be very slow at the beginning, very slow at the end, etc. Cool. So that's how we can then jump into making some very uh, bespoke animation as we really get into the meat of it and where shit really starts to look cool. All right. Um, but now I've introduced you guys to the um, aspects of adding easy ease, right? So select them, right click, keyframe assistant, easy ease, and then it will play back. Okay, so now we've done our immaculate animation and we need to render it so we can share it with the world. All right, so something that I will always stress with you guys is that you save regularly and that you save uh, under different save names. All right, so like um, project one underscore one underscore two underscore three. Reason for this is if uh, your computer does crash or if uh, SCOM hits and your save file gets corrupted, you don't want it all to be on a single save, right? You'd rather only lose a little bit of work by incrementally saving than putting all your eggs in one basket and losing everything in one massive file. All right. We also save another incremental save just before we render because unfortunately After Effects is a fickle bitch and if it crashes while it's rendering, that is a guaranteed corrupt save file, All right, which we don't want to do, please. We're in enough tiers already at the end of week eight. We don't need a crash and then redo everything kind of night. Okay, so let's assume that you have now saved everything correctly. We can then go File, Export, and we get a couple of options. Adding it to Adobe Media Encoder is something that we will be doing from our second term onwards. Adobe Media Encoder is a really dope render engine that Adobe made, uh, and it allows you to render multiple videos at the same time while still working inside of After Effects. 
Okay. Um, moving to the third option quickly, export to Adobe Premiere Pro project. Um, so if I had now finished whatever dope title sequence I was making, I could take that straight into Premiere and jump into my post-production editing. Um, if I had any Cinema 4D, 3D um, animation files, right, so models, textures, um, any sort of like backdrops, anything like that, um, I would need this to render those items separately because it wouldn't render properly with just the, the bog standard After Effects um, animation rendering process. Sorry, words, I know how to use them. Uh, so we're going to select Add to Render Queue. All right, and you'll notice as soon as we do that, our timeline changes. Okay, and you'll see that we've got these two little tabs. Now, we were working inside of a single composition. It is possible to put this composition inside of another one, inside of another one, inside of another one. Think of them as boxes that we could work inside of. Every box we make will have a little tab. Okay, so we can access those then by just clicking on these little tabs and moving through them as necessary. So the render queue gets its own little tab. And we get a couple of options for our rendering. Okay, best settings. Remember, if it's blue, we can click on it. So if we click on best settings, we just obviously want to make sure that it's set to best and full. And that's pretty much it. We don't have to change anything in here at the moment at all. You can say OK. Output module, currently set to lossless. We never render lossless, guys. Please, please never render lossless. Rendering a lossless file literally means that it's going to save every scrap of information that it possibly can. Uh, so if you were to render out a 10 second animation of a ball bouncing, which is something that we'll get to uh, by about week five, what you would end up with is a seven gig file of just a ball bouncing. All right, it's, it's terrible. You can't upload that. I can't download that. I can't mark it. It's not practical at all. Okay, so we don't render AVI lossless files. Instead, we click on lossless and we make sure that our format is set to QuickTime. All right, so if you're on Windows, your machine uh, might have automatically set it as AVI. Uh, we want to make sure that it is set to QuickTime. And then we've got format options with this little button over here, which opens up video codec options. All right, animation is what we will be using. There's uh, a couple ones sort of dedicated for Apple. Uh, I don't think that these are actually even render options on Windows because Apple doesn't like sharing its toys. Um, and then we've got all these other options as well that we can choose from. But animation is what we want. Uh, and we'll say OK. Cool. Uh, everything else we leave. We don't have to do anything with post-render action. We don't have to do anything uh, else with the format. RGB is just fine. Millions of colors. Uh, we can say OK to that. Then the last thing that we need to set is where we're going to render to. All right. Um, so if you're working on a machine that has been used before, it might already have its own path. Uh, if not, you'll see it says not yet specified. But it's important then to make sure that we um, set our own individual renders. You don't want to accidentally render your file into someone else's folder, and then you can't find it. Okay. So I click on that, and then I get my render window. All right. I never want to really render onto the desktop. All right. It's an unstable render path. Um, it's got a higher chance of crashing. So hopefully, under like your documents or in your folders, you've made a folder, for example, like MD100. Um, and then inside of that, you'll have all your work. And we could even make a folder for like renders, etc. And we can uh, move forward from there. Okay, so render into like a document rather. Um, then you'll see that our name is already set as class example. That's because we set our composition name at the very beginning. Okay, so I'm then just going to do this and I'm going to hit underscore one um, because we will always render multiple versions. Unfortunately, there will always be a mistake to go back and fix. Um, so underscore one, underscore two, underscore three, final, I swear this is it, good God, I wish I'd taken accounting instead. Um, get creative with your names. It's the only way to really make it worthwhile when it's four in the morning, uh, just before the deadline, and you've run out of Red Bull. All right, so for this example, class example one, I'll hit enter. And then the last thing I need to do is I just need to click this little render button over here. Click that. Get a nice little ding at the end. We know that it's done. Uh, we had our blue bar filling up, showing us progress. And we got the actual playback right, of our animation. But now imagine, for a moment, that this um, was an animation that was using hell of a lot of particle effects. And there were um, sort of heavy video footage and 4K images and was really heavy on the machine. Right? What's happening when we render here and we get this preview? is that um, it's basically rendering the video twice. It's rendering the video in the background, and it's rendering what we see over here. 
So you can imagine if you're working on something and the estimated time for that is 300 minutes um, or like 14 hours to render, you don't necessarily want to tax your machine any further by having it show a superfluous image over here, right? So to make sure that that doesn't happen, if you ever sort of need to render something a little bit faster, I'm just going to hit uh, Command D to copy this quickly. Um, if I turn Caps Lock on and I hit Render, it will not play back. All right. If I jump back into my example here and I try and drag it around, I'm going to get an error that says that the refresh has been disabled. Right? I just have to turn Caps Lock off, and then I can uh, refresh it like so. Okay. So if you ever get this error. Uh, caps lock on. If you get this error, um, don't worry, it's not broken. Just remember to um, turn caps lock off. But if you're ever working with a heavy render, hit caps lock and then it'll sort of help your machine not be so slow. Okay, so that was the process of uh, running through and doing a basic animation. Okay, I know that this video came out very late. So we're going to push the homework for a little, like a little bit further down the week. What I would like you guys to do is please follow along. Uh, then I would like you to animate a circle, not a square, a circle across the screen. Uh, and then I'd like you to render it out and submit to Classroom. All right, I think that that is a fairly easy request. Literally, if you follow along this tutorial and you paint by numbers, you'll be able to do it. Render it out. Make sure to label it correctly. Correct label is um, your student number. So, what, oh geez, I don't even remember what my student number was. Um, X, 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 uh, underscore J, Chamberlain. And then, um, so that, that is your, your correct sort of labeling. But it would also then be nice just to know um, what class time you're in, right? So if this was Wednesday, 10 to 11, whatever, that's a little bit of extra information. It's not something necessary, but it's something that you could add um, if you were a little bit worried about yours getting lost among the, the files. Okay, hopefully this made sense. Uh, again, I'm sorry that it took so long to bring out. I don't really have an excuse, so my sincerest apologies. Um, I hope that it's made sense. And yeah, I'll see you guys during the week. Have fun.